So we have discussed mainly about semiconductor lasers and uh, I think we were discussing this uh, threshold current and then there was uh, some power cut. So threshold current actually uh, can be seen from this figure that uh, Usually a semiconductor device, uh, the basic laser is a, a semiconductor source. Below certain injection current, it will act as an uh, LED. So that is uh, spontaneous emission. So if the threshold current is increased further, then the populations uh, will increase and then there will be effective inversion. And uh, after that, actually, the laser amplification uh, takes place. And uh, this is given by this uh, straight line. And the threshold current is much less in case of uh, heterostructure or specifically double heterostructure lasers. Simple homostructure lasers, it is not so because of uh, better radiation and carrier confinement in heterostructures. Now the threshold injected current density uh, was given by JT is a, a loss factor that is a reflective loss plus the medium loss alpha R plus alpha by alpha and the current density called J capital T which is known as the transparency current. Transparency current is the level of current when the charge uh, pump is enough to the medium such that uh, there are enough number of photons uh, have been produced uh, up to the saturation level of that medium. Now one more photon is produced then that uh, that will no longer be absorbed by that medium but it will come out as the radiation. So that is known as the transparency level. So that is given E charge of an electron into thickness divided by the quantum efficiency and the recombination lifetime multiplied by the carrier concentration. So where alpha R is resonator cavity loss coefficient and Alpha is the loss factor of our all. Now the current uh, IT is uh, JT multiplied by the cross-sectional area that is W into B. So here is an example that uh, this time I think there was power cut. So this is a quaternary laser INGASP and here the carrier concentration is not that much 1.25 uh, carrier concentration corresponding to the transparency level is 1.25 into 10 to the power 18 per centimeter cube overall loss factor 600 per centimeter inverse per centimeter recombination lifetime 2.5 times second refractive index 3.5 uh, this uh, efficiency, eta quantum efficiency may vary from 0.5 to 0.99. The dimension is uh, lengthwise 200 micrometer, that is the cavity length, width is 10 micrometer. And uh, a would be like the uh, thickness. Thickness is uh, 2 micron. Then it can be computed uh, that transparency 
current density is El by eta tau r into delta N1 and that is uh, around 3.2 into 10 to the power 4 ampere per centimeter square. Now, how do I compute the surface reflectance? It is given as I was discussing last time that because the refractive index is sufficiently high, so that itself acts as a mirror. And uh, the discontinuity, if assuming that the thickness is much lower with respect to the length, so therefore, more or less, the, the photons are traveling parallelly. So in that case, uh, the energy reflection coefficient we have derived before for ultrasonics. Same thing is applicable here as well. That is n minus 1 by n plus 1. Assuming the outside medium is air of refractive index 1. So n minus 1 by n plus 1 whole square. That is approximately 0.31. Then the mirror loss coefficient is uh, can be derived from the exponential loss profile. That is given 1 by v into ln 1 by r. So that is uh, approximately 59 centimeter inverse. I, uh, if we assume that alpha s, the surface loss coefficient uh, or self loss coefficient is equal to the mirror loss coefficient equal to 59 and the confinement factor t is equal to 1. That is an assumption. Actually, T can never be 1. Now, alpha R, the resonation, resonator cavity loss coefficient is given 1 by T, alpha S plus alpha M, that is 118 per centimeter. Then the threshold current is computed like this, alpha R plus alpha by alpha. Alpha is the gain factor or the overall loss factor. So, we multiply it by the transparency current. So that is uh, 3.8 into 10 to the power 4 ampere per centimeter square. So if we multiply by the cross section, then the threshold current becomes 760 milliampere. Actually, it is very high because this length is 2 micrometer. Now for heterostructure and double heterostructure lasers, this L can be considerably lower. So, like say, we have discussed before that it can go to 0.2 micron or 0.1 micron for uh, heterostructural lasers. So, if it is uh, thickness is uh, 0.1 micron, then uh, this will be simply divided by 20. And uh, of course, uh, this current will be also divided by 20. So, this becomes 38 milliampere. IT becomes uh, as low as 38 milliampere. So this I was writing when the power was off. So you, uh, this is just a demonstration that how this uh, threshold current is uh, computed. Now there is another important aspect of uh, semiconductor laser or other lasers as well is the spectral distribution. So spectral distribution is dependent on the two factor. Of spectral quality. Of semicon or laser depends on two factor. One is uh, bandwidth of the positive can. region that we have seen that 
if the career concentration is increased, so we have a positive gain region. And then second one is the resonator cavity filter. That also we have discussed because the gain is achieved by multiple reflections. So depending on the length of the cavity, actually the gain will vary. And the construction, constructive and uh, destructive uh, interference is a function of wavelength. So therefore, that will uh, that will be periodic. So as we have discussed that there will be some positive gain region. Suppose this is the positive gain region. Zero dB is positive gain. Now because of multiple reflections between a cavity, there will be a frequency distribution created, which is usually narrower. So it will vary like this because of multiple reflection and constructive and destructive interference will take place and there will be some longitudinal filters uh, action will be will arise due to that so that can be given by the frequency specific spacing between this these these are known as the longitudinal modes due to multiple reflections. In the resonating cavity. This is lambda wavelength. Now, so therefore, there are uh, there is there is a variation of intensity at various wavelengths. Now, to pick up one such wavelength, we we can use a filter, a narrowband filter around uh, one of the peak wavelengths, and uh, then the output will be a pure uh, a narrowband laser. Otherwise, there can be multiple cavities So multiple cavities are these are two cavities in parallel so what will happen that there will be reflection back and forth here okay. and there will be also reflection back and forth at this place. So now the ultimate output that will be the final output
will correspond to the positive peak in the final output will correspond to the integer multiple or integer multiple of these two cavity lengths because both the uh, both the cavities should should be at at a, a maximum point corresponding to the final output to a sustained oscillation takes place both the oscillator condition oscillating condition need to be satisfied so therefore if we choose these two length such a way that it will corresponds the integer multiple will corresponds one of one of them one of it will pick up one of these peaks so then uh, the others uh, uh, modes will be filtered out so frequency spacing between longitudinal modes It depends on the length of the cavity of lambda if we expressed in terms of frequency new f so that will be c by 2d or c0 by 2nd n is the refractive index d is the length c0 is the velocity For example, for n equal to 3.5 and d equal to, say, if we take a little bit more, 400 micrometer. So that would be in some hundreds of gigahertz, approximately say 100, 10 gigahertz. If the bandwidth, if the positive bandwidth, positive can 
bandwidth is say 1.2 terahertz number of modes will be number of longitudinal modes One point eight into ten to the power twelve by hundred ten into ten to the power nine. So approximately. 10, 11, 10 to 11. Of course, we can also determine the lambda spacing from this new F from, uh, we can uh, get what would be the spacing in corresponding spacing in lambda. So we will not discuss further all those things. We shall come back to these source uh, applications when we shall discuss about various uh, instrumentation devices again. So now quickly we will go to our next uh, topic. We don't have time for discussing this thing in detail here. As a part of the components in uh, optical instruments we are discussing this thing. So our next topic will be optical detector. So optical detectors as we have discussed can be wide band and narrow band. So generally they are characterized by a measurement point of view, they are characterized by several parameters. The first one, of course, is the responsivity. Responsivity is given by ampere, ampere per watt. And then we have time constant, which is also very important in second. Then the wavelength response that is the responsivity versus lambda. this wavelength. And then we have noise equivalent power. Noise equivalent power is also very important. Though detector 
can be quite sensitive. Some of the detectors can measure even single photons as well. However, we have to keep in mind the measurement conditions. Depending on the measurement condition, especially the temperature of the ambient, the noise equivalent power will be determined. So when we require very fine or measurement of very low optical power, so we may have to go for pulling of the optical detectors. So we shall discuss uh, uh, some principles, some detect detector principles. So as we have discussed that there could be thermal detectors and uh, thermal detectors are basically uh, thermistors or thermocouples in series. So then there are of course uh, other kind of semiconductor and uh, photo tubes are also available. So first one we shall discuss about uh, the vacuum photo tubes. The vacuum photo tube is uh, the basic principle is very simple based on vacuum diode principle. We have a cathode here. Negatively biased. Then there is one anode. And we have a load resistance through which the charge is uh, collected. And then we can have a output voltage V0 at this point across the array. Photon is incident at this point. This is the photons. As the name suggests, the anode and cathodes are in a vacuum tube or low pressurized tube. So, corresponding to this, there will be liberations of carriers which will be collected by the so these are the electrons which is collected Collected by the anode. Now, usually the voltage requirement for such kind of vacuum uh, photodiode photo tube is very high. To make to give enough acceleration to the liberated carriers such that they are successfully collected by the anode. So the, uh, at the same time, to collect more number of photons, so this is photon. This uh, area of this uh, 
cathode has to be also high enough such uh, to enhance the adsorption of photon energy and corresponding liberation of the electrons however the, uh, this one is usually in case of uh, in case of commercial uses just one uh, photo tube may not be sufficient to give a good sensitivity so therefore this is usually a done with several stages of amplification So when incident photons knock down one electron, so that will be first collected by this electrode. However, there is a biasing potential is here between this and uh, between the third one third electrode and the second electrode. So therefore, this will liberate also secondary electron. And depending on this biasing potential, there will be certain amount of amplifications. So the whole thing is, of course, uh, inside a vacuum tube. The resistive circuit or the biasing circuit are, of course, outside because that will give rise to temperature. So this is a cool. Back one tube. Because there are multiplications uh, of carriers are taking place in this. So this is known as the photomultiplier tube. Usually, this is cooled by liquid nitrogen. If we require very good sensitivity, otherwise it can be Peltier cooled up to minus 25 or minus 30 or minus 50 degrees Celsius. But if we require good sensitivity and uh, a multiplying uh, multiplying factor uh, quite high, so in that case that is cooled by liquid nitrogen. The secondary ones are known as dianodes.
I think there is a lot of noise here coming outside. Amplification by dianodes. can be as high as 10 to the power 7 and able to detect down to the energy of single photons. Of course, the energy level of this uh, photon will depend not only on the number of photons, but its wavelength as well. So, for example, the lower wavelengths will have lesser energy. Uh, lower wavelengths will have higher energy and higher wavelength will have lower energy. So these can be uh, this kind of devices because the carriers are liberated in free space and collected by the electrodes, in this case secondary electrodes. So the number of dianodes can be from 10 to 100 the more the number of dianodes controlling or uh, getting a stable gain becomes that is uh, diff more difficult so usually the ge geometry of dianodes needs to be designed carefully to avoid collision of carriers Multiplier tubes are very important from scientific experiment point of view, but because of explicit cooling requirement and sometimes the uh, gain becomes unstable. So due to that, it has a limited application in industry. application
in industry because of cooling requirement. Very heavy cooling requirement. And at times, game becomes unstable. So if the game becomes unstable, the PMTs need to be switched off and the two terminals need to be sorted to neutralize the unstable carrier inside the vacuum tube. Popular photo detectors are based on semiconductor photodiodes. Semiconductor photodiodes are popular because those are basically uh, due to the internal photoelectric effect. So the carriers does not come outside the medium or to vacuum. So therefore carrier management is relatively easier. Carrier management in semiconductor photodiodes. Are done by choosing appropriate material. biasing voltages and also cooling. However, here cooling requirement is not that much. Generally, it can be done by thermoelectric uh, cooling or Peltier cooling is sufficient for most of the photodiodes. There are, of course, uh, photodiodes which have internal gains just like photomultiplier tubes. So in such cases, cooling requirement is heavy. Diodes with the internal gain. Mm. 
we are known as avalanche photodiodes. The function of the semiconductor photodiodes is uh, can be in three stages. divided in three stages. That is uh, generation, generation by absorbed photons the more number of photons absorbed per unit area means sensitivity is more then transport but just the generating carriers from photons is not sufficient, it has to be transported to the outside of the device and collected by the external circuit. So usually that is enhanced by applied field and then third one is amplification. So that is of course only available with avalanche photodiodes, which are popularly known as APD. The efficiency is characterized efficiency given by one minus R into eta one minus exponential of minus alpha into D one minus R is the transmission R is the reflection coefficient, so this is transmitted into the material. It is the ratio or the percentage of the electron hole pair that can avoid not percentage, it is a number less than one. So it is the ratio electron hole pair that can avoid the combination at the material surface.
at the material. Alpha is the absorption coefficient. of the photons. So the last term 1 minus exponential of minus alpha d it represents the fraction of photon flux absorbed in the material. So there are of course uh, other two factors because uh, the device uh, operates based on characterized by the band graph energy operation of a photodiode. semiconductor photodiode is characterized by the band gap energy and the band gap of wavelength. Every band gap energy will correspond to a characteristic band gap wavelength that we have seen in case of sources as well. So therefore here uh, what will be given by that absorption cannot occur when lambda 0 greater than equal to lambda g. Lambda G is related to band gap energy that is HC0 by EG. So that means photon energy that is photon energy is insufficient insufficient to overcome the band gap so this is known as the long wavelength limit There is of course a limit on the shorter side also. Very small lambda zero. Again, new decreases. or eta decreases, the efficiency decreases as most of the photons are 
absorbed near the surface. As the surface recombination lifetime is short. So, therefore, the net uh, successful carriers, those are corrected by the outside circuit, is low. So, this is usually known as the short wavelength limit. This, I think today we will stop here. We shall continue our discussion tomorrow.